this man, I mean, he's always in the news, he's on TV, he's on the internet, he's an activist, a radio talk show host, a producer, a curator of the groundbreaking, the projected image for TMC, which reaches over 70, what is it, 87 million. Um, he's a powerhouse, brilliant. I met him, I think it was, it was track of time, but <laughs> I think it was about 10 years ago um, in Washington, DC. And I've, since then I've always admired him. And I heard about his name, you know, his name was always out there before I met him and then there he was. And here he is, Lawrence Carter Long. Yay! Hey, <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm doing very well. And I'm thrilled, thrilled to meet the biz and to be here with you today. <laughs> you are the biz. I am the biz. Yeah, you are the biz. So, um, I, you know, I, I yeah, that was 10 years ago, and it was at the executive office building, the White House, as a matter of fact, right? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. What was your title at that time? Do so you... in those days, I was um, I was the uh, the communications guy, the public of what they called public affairs and government for the National Council on Disability. So that's the independent federal agency that the Americans with Disabilities Act came out of and way before my time. But, but the mandate of NCD was to sort of um, advise the president and Congress about policy issues that were related to disability. So they hired me away from the work I was doing in New York City. And I went down to DC in, uh, that was 2011. Yeah, so just about 10 years ago uh, to do the public you know, relations, what they would call in the real world or communications director in the nonprofit world for the, the independent federal agency. So I was doing that. Yeah. And I remember there was an event, I think it was the event we were doing um, at the White House that involved our, our mutual friend, Jerry Jewell and, yeah. and the Push Girls. Yeah. And we were talking about representation of disability in media. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was that's one of those moments in 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 your life where you don't forget going to the White House, and and not just going to the White House, going with your friends, going yeah. with people that you love and you work with. Um, now, before that, I mean, you you were you're you're a dancer, aren't you? Yeah, well, I, in, in those days, certainly, I, mean, I think, well, once once a dancer, always a dancer, right? It never, never quite leaves. Um, um, I've had two, uh, three left feet all my life. Yeah, it's the, it's the, that's, the, in disability circles, that's a good thing. I, I think, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So I had I'd done uh, a modern, it would have to be modern dance with me. It's not going to be classical ballet. Um, um, I had done work with, with Heidi Latsky who had a, a show yeah. um, that was called GIMP. And that was kind of in your face, right? It was a little bit of a, a preemptive strike. We were gonna say it before anybody else said it. And, and but, but it's because I'm a word nerd and we were playing around with definitions, right? So definitions of the word GIMP was like one who limps or hobbles, right. right? That's pretty obvious. But there's also fighting spirit or vigor is one of the archaic, the old definitions that's not used anymore. And you know, those little lanyards, those little bracelets that people have are called GIMP interwoven fabric. And so we tried to take all of the various definitions of GIMP and we really incorporated those and sort of put those into the show. So I, I had been helping Heidi do some PR for uh, a dance project that she was doing with Lisa Bufano, who is a bilateral amputee, a dancer who had amputations on all four limbs. So. Lisa had a solo, Heidi had a solo, Five Open Mouths, and, and they were doing this show in New York City. I lived in New York City at the time. So I started doing PR for them for that show, just as a favor, because I loved what they were doing. We were going to the bar. There were two performances, I think. We were going to the bar, as you do, after the performances. And Heidi noticed, as a, she's a choreographer, right? She, um, uh, and, and she noticed the way that I walk, which is not typical. And she said, I. I can't move like you do. I'd love to work with you. And in my head, I hadn't thought about doing modern dance. I'd gone and done a, 
a week-long intensive with Axis Dance here in Oakland. Yeah. But I did that kind of as a lark just to see what would happen if I had to shut up and get out on the on the stage and <laughs> and how that would be, what that would be like, because I'd never really done it before. So I did it as a lark, but I kind of just put it in the background. That's how I met Lisa, the, the dancer. And when, and the when, was this, when was this about? This was a, around 2007, 2006, oh. 2007, somewhere in there. And so Heidi says that to me, and I'm thinking in my mind that she wants me to do more PR for, for her, right? For her other projects she's doing, because it's not computing. And I said, well, Heidi, I'd love to, but I'm really busy. And and, 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 and she said, no, 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 like as a dancer. And because I, I couldn't imagine how I was going to do that, like mm -hmm. I said, well, yes, well, well, we absolutely have to, right? So I, I have to do that because I couldn't yeah. figure out how I would literally do that and like shut up and move. So it became this second career for me. So we, you know, started putting together these, these solo pieces that became duets. There was a guy named Jeffrey Freeze whose physicality is very different than mine. He's sort of short and stout and I'm long and skinny. And she had us both working in the studio at the same time working on solo pieces and she said okay you go over there and steal part of parts of what he's doing his movements and you take some of his movements and go over there and then she collided us she threw us together and and that grew into this 72 minute show wow. that you know had uh, i think eight people in the cast and both was it recorded were, pardon was it recorded it was yeah it was recorded and and then you know we did things like we opened and it had different iterations after I left. And when I went to government work in 2011, yeah. they had a second cast and then a third cast and people like um, um, Jerron Herman, who, who's, who's on uh, the uh, cover of Dance Magazine now and, and other, other people um, really took over and just sort of what we started and ran with it, right? Yeah. But when I stopped, when I got the government job, but it, we, we toured the world. We opened the Dublin Dance Festival. Uh -huh. um, we went to Kathmandu, Nepal. We toured the United States. We had two or three different runs in New York City. Uh, we toured the States, did Lincoln, Nebraska, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and places uh -huh. in between. So, so it, be, it became this second career at around the age of 40. Yeah. That's something that I had never anticipated or planned for. Um, but the, it took a choreographer who saw something in my movement that I didn't see myself. Well, and that kind of opened the doors for me. Well, what's so amazing is that, yes, and it's that improv thing. Yes. It's like she said, what about dance? Yes, I've got to do it. I've got to try. Yes. So, and, and you do that. And, and I mean, at the age of five, you were the poster child for social social change. Is this true? Well, that was, I was a, well, I, yeah, it was for the what they used to call the United Fund right. in my hometown where I grew up of Indianapolis until we moved and went to Terre Haute later. But I grew up in Indiana. And so at, at five years old, when I started walking, um, um, you know, they said, there's a little blonde kid who won't shut up. Let's grab him. And, and um, they, they kind of, you know, I fit the profile, right? I was like this little, you know, bow-headed, you know, smiley kid and, and very outgoing. And, and my job as a poster child was to kind of go out on stage, take a few steps and, and, and say to people, thanks to you, it's working. Thanks to you, I'm walking, right? Because the goal is, oh, you have to walk. You have to be like normal people. And but then, you know, right, Eli Lilly and other places would get out their checkbooks and they'd make a donation. And I didn't think much about, you know, the stereotypes of disability or, you know, the positives and negatives, the tragic heroic stuff that we all can kind of talk about now once you're involved in those issues. I just knew that everybody was making a, a big deal <laughs> about the fact that I was walking. And, and I, it, so there was this one part of me that was like, why is it so important to walk? Like, don't you like me just as I am? What if I wasn't walking? Would you still like me then? And 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 but I also learned that you know because we would do these public appearances and media work, you know, go on television, the local TV shows mm -hmm. here in Indianapolis, and that if you, as we've seen by le recent political developments the last few years, right? If you go on TV and you can put a sentence or two together, 
um, even if you don't know what you're talking about half the time, people think you do, right? right. And so it imprinted, I think, on my very young brain that media work has a big influence, you know? And, and so I originally in high school and even in college got into acting and theater. That was my passion. Gosh. And, and um, but I got tired, uh, you know, and it was another, that was another situation where I had a, both a theater teacher, Gene Schutt in Terre Haute, Indiana, where I went to high school yeah. and Kay Butler in, uh, at, in Hammond, Louisiana at Southeastern Louisiana University who encouraged me to go and audition and uh, perform in competitions and, and do all these things that I don't know that I would have done on my own. Yeah. But I got really tired of them trying to explain away the way that I walk and they would give me a cane or something and, and so, you know, I'd play the old man. And there I am 19, 20 years old. And I'm like, I don't want to play an old man for the rest of my life. Like, I, why, why can't I be the romantic lead or whatever yeah. the, the thing might be? So I stopped acting um, um, at that time. Okay. But those skills that you learn, right? When to turn it on, when to turn it off, when to turn it up, when to turn it down, um, how to kind of tap into your emotions were really useful when I got into advocacy work. It was one of those things where I, I had a job doing community organizing and not even in disability. I didn't do disability work again. I uh, did it when I was five, didn't do it again until I was 35. So I had this, this sort of 30 year career in right. between doing media, doing advocacy, so social justice work, but I was doing it primarily in some media literacy stuff and primarily in animal protection work. I was doing animal protection work. And I had an executive director Right. Um, say to me at one point, I was, he was really nervous about doing this TV interview. And he said, would you mind doing it? And I said, well, what are the issues? And he prepped me a little bit and bam, I went and did the TV interview. And he said, you're good at that. Would you like to be our first communications coordinator? I thought about it for a half second. Right. And I went, why, well, yes, I would. So it, it, the, all of those, those circumstances, whether it's with Heidi Latsky and dance right. or the theater teachers, um, or that that executive director who was afraid to do the TV interview um, kind of gave me opportunities, right? And helped me kind of adopt this motto. If I were to say, I, if I had a motto that has followed the various phases of my life and my career, it would be go through the doors that open, right? And that's why there are these detours along the way. It's not a real linear path that I've taken, um, but sort of looking back in hindsight, I'm 53, I'll be 54 this year. Oh, it makes a crazy kind of sense. Right, right. I love that message <clears throat> that you just said, go through the doors that are open. Is, is that your motto in life? Yeah, I, I think if I had to pick a motto, I, when I look back, that's the path that I've taken. <laughs> that's yeah. the road that I've traveled. You know, when, when, when a door seems to open up, more often than not, I've been able or willing to go, hmm, what's over there? And then explore that. Yeah. And, and, and that really has led me down these various paths. I never thought that I, you know, again, doing disability uh, media work was not part of the plan. <laughs> well, it's so interesting too, because I, you know, I fought it at some times during my life. It's like something was right there in front of me. It's like, uh, uh, should I, I did, uh, and then, and I know a lot of people who do that their whole life. And when they get to the end of their life, it's like, they have a bunch of these. I mean, they, they've lived their life. They've done a lot of wonderful stuff, but I've learned as I grow older to, to that it's so satisfying to explore what's behind that door to, and it, it will get you to places that you didn't expect you would go, which is, Absolutely. And, and, and places that you couldn't have seen or you couldn't have imagined, you know, things that were not in the plan. But because you took that, that initial step just through the door, just to see what was on the other side, other doors open up, other possibilities open up, right? But it takes that willingness to go, hmm, this seems to be getting some attention. <laughs> this yeah. seems to be beckoning something. Someone's knocking. Hello. And, and then go, <laughs> Hmm, well, where is this going to take me? So it's a, you know, kind of a sense of curiosity about it. Oh, what's that about? And, and you know, that was kind of what happened 
when I got involved in, in disability advocacy. I right. did the poster child thing when I was five, thought I had it all figured out. Yeah. And, and then I'm 35 years old and I'm seeing a movie, Million Dollar Baby, right? Which is a, has an assisted suicide theme to it. And everybody else in the audience applauds at the end. And I'm going, why are you applauding? <laughs> this does not seem to me to be something that, that would be um, something we'd wanna support, right? And, I, and, and it dawned on me, maybe that's what they think about people like me too, right? I've had cerebral palsy since I was born. And it got me asking, cogitating about all these different questions, whose lives are worth living? What are the media messages we see around disability? And, and I thought, wow, there, there were a bunch of things that I just hadn't really seen happening and I, and I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. Other people had kind of kicked open the doors and there'd been the duty humans of the world and people that had done the, the 504 sit-ins and who had fought to get the ADA passed. And I, in my mind, I kind of assumed all that was done. But then when I started to talk to people about the themes that I saw in that movie, I realized society hadn't quite caught up with where the advocates, advocates were, the activists were. And because I'd been doing advocacy, I was like, mm, maybe I can do some of this media stuff in the disability world. And, and that was a door, that was a situation where I took a career that I'd built over 17 years and I'd gotten good at doing media work, but I just felt this compulsion that I needed to do. I didn't know any other disabled people. I didn't hang out with any other disabled people. And I thought, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> maybe there's something I could learn over there. And, and so I pivoted. I, I applied for a job in New York City at a place called the Disabilities Network of New York City that helped to bring a policy agenda to the mayor's office. It was Mayor Bloomberg at the time. Right. And um, it, it was doing that, that you know people started asking, well, we have a bunch of people that are in their 60s and 70s that are coming to our meetings, but where are the young people? And, and I, I was sort of in the middle, right? I was in my mid thirties. So I was thinking, why are you doing things that are gonna encourage them to get involved? Something that they're jazzed about. And, and, and so we created this, it was a six month experiment that lasted four years. Something called the Dis This Film Series. And it was right. a screening series. So one night a month, first Wednesday of the month, we would screen a movie that was international or that didn't have distribution in the US that was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We had this sense that disability, the assumptions about it were that it had to be sappy or safe or sentimental for people to kind of accept it. Right. And the, the, the question we had, we always had a question going in, what if we did something that wasn't that, that exploded those expectations and gave some people something else to see? And so we had, we got the room donated, we got speakers to come in and talk to us. And it just, it, we had 20, you know, it started with 25 people, and then it was 45 people, then it was 75 people, then we had 100 people every screening. And, and we thought, wow, this is amazing. And people were like, please don't stop at the end of the six months. Yeah. So we partnered with uh, New York University and we, we continued that screening series for, for another three and a half years. And, and it was amazing because what we saw is you, we, we, after the second screening, which we did with uh, British actor, Matt Fraser. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, we, after the second screening we did with him, we realized we should always have a discussion afterwards because you're processing what you just saw through the experience of somebody across the aisle from you. Maybe somebody you'd never be in a room with before yeah. or again, right? Somebody who has a different perspective. And that's where the movie came alive. That's where the magic happened because all of a sudden people are relating to these things yeah. and they're understanding, wow, never thought about that before. And, and people would just start showing up. Like we would do all this local promotion. We got in places like the New York Times and, and, and disability studies quarterly, academics were writing about us. And, and because it was much bigger than me, it was this kind of thing where people wanted a place to come together to kind of talk about these things. Yeah. And there wasn't anything quite like that. So we started bringing in this younger generation who were concerned and, and, and involved in the arts and, and interested in how um, their own, you know, how the representation was played out kind of in the arts and movies and film. And then they got involved in, in the, the political process and in public policy as a result. It was sort of a gateway drug, if you will. I um, just love um, this. I mean, I mean, to hear this, I could see the domino effect or even 
just the touching and going from this thing this, to TMC and this and that, to, to all of, to, even from GIMP to TMC to the, 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 the disc film challenge. Of course, you mentioned Judy Human. Now, right, yes. when, when, I mean, when was the, I mean, I know right now you're connected and doing work with Judy. Yeah, now, a little, yeah, it's one of those amazing things, right? So in, in I, I got, I'd seen her name, I'd heard of her when I sort of did my- When, when did you first hear the name Judy Human? So I know that, you know, Judy Human was one of the founders of a group, an advocacy group in New York City that's sort of venerable, went around um, since the 70s called Disabled in Action. So three words, not two, Disabled in Action. And, and so I knew of Judy's work through that. The, the older generation schooled me kind of on the disability history and all the things I didn't know, yeah. um, which was really important. You know, the first six months I was at the Disabilities Network, I really endeavored to keep my mouth shut and my eyes and ears open because I wanted to survey the landscape. I needed to learn what I hadn't learned for 30 years of not doing disability work. So yeah. what's the lay of the land? What's working? What's not working? Where can I be of service to the work that these other people have done, these trails that others have blazed? And so I knew of Judy at that point, but she had gone on to do um, work in the Office of, of uh, Disability Services in DC. And she, she, she was living in other places we hadn't met. So we didn't actually meet until around the time, so we did the this, this film series, right? And that lasted from 2006 to around 2009, 2010. And, and um, that, that's around the time when I, just before I moved to, to Washington DC, right? But while I was still in New York, um, I'd done a lot of work with inclusion in the arts. And I know you just recently had Christine Bruno on. Right. One of my nearest and dearest friends. And, and so it was doing work with inclusion in the arts there in New York City. Um, Cindy Gordon had noticed, she was a big fan of Turner Classic Movies, and she noticed they'd been doing these special festivals of Native Americans in film and LGBTQ in film and, and Latinos in film. And she came up with the idea. It was really her brainstorm. She said, why aren't they doing disability in film? Everybody wins an award, wins an award for playing a disabled person. So it was Cindy who did the initial outreach to them, and then uh, and then she brought me on board, and and you know we started shaping it. They they I'm I'm a movie nerd, and having done this this, so I was looking through the history of disability in film, and I had a list of about seventy five films, and then after and I had watched when we began that project, I'd watched I watched in all in all I watched two hundred and thirty seven movies to decide the 20, we ended up doing 21, the 21 that we could screen as part of this month long festival on the air, on the channel. And um, so we had to kind of do, we had eight decades to look at, right? From the silent era, so right. from the, the teens and the twenties into the thirties and forties and fifties. And so initially I started looking at, okay, were there things that they did in the silent era that they didn't, that they did maybe a little differently in the thirties and then maybe did they do things in the 40s that they weren't doing in the 30s? And what did they do in the 50s? So I was looking at it by decade. Yeah. And I realized pretty early on that the themes were the same. Didn't matter which decade you were in. So, you know, whether it was returning home from war, if it was World War I or World War II or Korea or Vietnam, the themes were basically the same. People adjusting like in best years of our lives to being newly disabled and what that means on, on what jobs you can get or what kind of life you can have when you come home. Or, or maybe it was monster movies, right? And disabled people being isolated. Every movie Lon Chaney ever made, right? Was sort of the, the one lone person hidden in the bowels of the opera or you know, being, being a loner, whether it's the Hunchback of Notre Dame or whatever it could be. These themes kind of reappeared over and over again, decade after decade. And so what we ended up doing at TCM is taking those various themes and then each night we would showcase a different aspect of how disability was portrayed on film. And, and that was so successful. Um, um, and I did that in partnership with Inclusion in the Arts that by the time it aired, by the time you know, we did all the prep work, which took between two and three years, I had left New York City 
and I was living in DC doing the government work by that point, but I told them when I took the government job, I'm gonna see this project through because this needs to happen. Yeah. And you know, we did these interstitials, these little promo packages, video packages in between the films that included people like Marley Matlin, Jerry Jewell, um, uh, Robert David Hall, um, um, uh, Kurt, so, you know, uh, uh, Danny Woodburn. So, we, you know, we brought in all these, these great folks to kind of talk about what their favorite disability films were and what the themes were that they had encountered as a way to kind of connect it to modern life and how these things hadn't changed. So that became, you know, that became a two to three year project um, that we did uh, that aired actually in October of 2012. Why is it important to you? Why is it important to everybody that we do this festival? Well, perception of disability has changed throughout time. You know, from the time of the silence, uh, from even uh, the, the first film, one of the first films Thomas Edison did, The Fake Beggar, um, up through now in 2012, has certainly changed. There have been trends um, from the silent era, going through the different wars that we've had, the social changes in society, our attitudes about physical disability, mental disability have all changed. Those have been reflected in the films that we show and the films that we see, and they've both informed what happens in society and informed those notions about society. So in order to understand where we are, we have to understand where we've been. Oh, wow. And I was doing that, uh, which is to get back to your question, it was, well, I went to a political fundraiser sometime around then in Washington, D.C., and Judy was working for the federal, because she was working at State Department at that point. Yeah. And Judy, we're there in the thing, and we kind of wave hello to each other across the room, and, and she's like, how did you end up doing that Turner Classic Movies thing? And it turns out she was a big fan of classic films, so we got to talking about that and just kind of hit it off from there, and then lo and behold, um, Judy gets a fellowship with the Ford Foundation and writes this report on a roadmap really for inclusion of disability in media. And when I decided to leave government, um, and this was almost four years ago in 2017, I went back to my advocacy roots. Donald Trump came into office. I decided I wasn't gonna be as effective working for the government. You have to be kind of neutral when you're working for the government. And I didn't wanna be neutral anymore. I figured it was time to take a few punches. Yeah. So um, I went back to my advocacy roots and, and um, was able to start working with the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, which is the first legal defense fund for disabled folks that have been around since 1979 and in Berkeley, right? So I got as far away from Washington DC as I could both kind of philosophically and geographically went across the country to do work at DREDF and Judy, has been a board member of DREDF for a very long time. Okay. And, and um, DREDF again is what? Is Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. So that's where I'm currently, I, I'm the director of communications there. And, and DREDF had started back 2007, 2008, something called the Disability Media Alliance Project. And um, it was a way to help um, reporters and editors tell better stories about disability outside of that same tragic or heroic kind of, um, you know, extremes that we often see. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do and I was most excited about, in addition to helping boost DREDF's work, whether it's, you know, DREDF's work really centers around um, legislation, right? Um, we'll help pass the laws. We have a legislative person, Carol Tyson in Washington, DC, and we work on different laws across the country. Um, uh, litigation, if you don't follow those laws, we'll sue you, right? Which we did with Netflix to make sure that they got captioning now. And then education, we're one of the, the parent training information centers that trains parents how to advocate for their kids who are in special ed classes. And as those kids grow up, we train them to advocate for themselves to become self-advocates. So there's uh, uh, legislation, litigation, education that DREDF does. I wanted to be a part of that. And it seemed like it was a real important to be, be to doing that work. Um, but the media needed to be a component. Yeah. And, and DREDF had never had a communications director before. So it was, it was highlighting and signal boosting all that existing work that DREDF was doing. And then also revitalizing that Disability Media Alliance project so that we could really change hearts and minds, right? You can change all the laws you want. Well, it, it's so amazing, you know, you're saying changing hearts and minds. I mean, let's just take Netflix, for example. You, you got them to do captioning and now 
they have this big thing now where they're giving, I don't know how much, thousands, millions, I don't know, money to develop shows with uh, people with disabilities. And right, and we're seeing, you know, what we kind of jokingly call uh, uh, Jim Lebrecht, who's another um, yeah. uh, board member of DREDF, um, is largely responsible for me coming out here and working for the organization. He raised money and gave some of his own money, um, as did some of the staffers there, um, to kind of get me out here. And, and um, um, you know, so there's, I think, this realization, what we see in the culture now, 2021, that, that I've never seen before. And this is somebody who's worked in media since I was 25 years old and, and most of those years now doing disability work. Um, uh, uh, you know, we used to have to sell it, right? Where people would think disability was, was sort of a diagnosis. And for most of human history, disability has been a diagnosis. Yeah. But now, if you, you, you know from, from the work that you've done, if you ask people that are active and engaged in, in disability community what the word disability means to them, they're not gonna tell you their diagnosis. They're not gonna tell you that they've got cerebral palsy or Down syndrome or whatever. What they're more likely to tell you is that it's about constituency, if they're doing political work, it's about community or culture, right? It's, it's about history, a shared history. Those are the things which bring people together. Mm. And those were the things that I was missing when I was 35. And, and so it was, it was this, there's this realization now that disability is bigger than, than we gave it credit for. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's responsible for so much. You know, for me, it was kind of a, um, um, a process of coming home to disability where I could be all of myself be completely 100% fully myself, when I embraced my disability, then I found all these other people, you know, which Judy and, and, and Jim and people, Nicole Noonan, you know, the co-director showed in Crip Camp, right? That if you get disabled people together, they all of a sudden realize, wait, your experience is kind of close to mine. And I had this happen to me too. And then if, it's, if it involves discrimination or injustice, then people get ticked off and then they climb the stairs of the Capitol and lo and behold, the ADA is passed, right? And, and that, things happen. And things happen. Things happen when people come together. You just, you just put a definition or definitions behind disability. What is your definition or definitions for the word normal? I, I, I see, I, I don't even, know. well, it's interesting. Somebody once asked me when I was doing a media interview, you know, wouldn't I want to be normal? You know, there's these assumptions. And I said, what, what possible benefit could there be to me lowering my standards, right? Why would I just want to be normal? You know, there was this realization at some point around the, the time I started doing disability work that I was never going to be normal, whether I walked the same way anybody else did or not. And, and so there, I think what we find, you know, whether it was with this, this, or with GIMP, there's a, there's a certain liberation on the fringes. There's a certain liberation to being a little bit on the outside. Now, nobody wants to be excluded from anything. Nobody wants to be cut out or left out. But you get it, you realize when you kind of embrace those things that might make you different in other people's lives, there's a freedom there that, that, that all of a sudden you've got a little more flexibility, a little more freedom to push the envelope or to, or to, to, to shake things up. And, and so what I, what I would hope um, for normal is, is that it's a relative situation, that normal to each person is relative to them. And, and coming to understand that or embrace that is a process, right? So normal for an actor, right, might mean going out on stage and being in a movie, but that wouldn't be normal for a school teacher, right? Or, or that wouldn't be normal for a politician necessarily. And so I think we all get to define for in some way, shape or form, the world I'd like to see is a world in which we get to define that normal for ourselves. And then we get a chance to live it. I, it, it, I don't know if the word's epiphany or what, but I was just taking you in and it just like, just touched me in the sense that it's like even like coming to Hollywood and, and wanting to act or wanting to be in the business, you see a certain <laughs> a so-called, I, I picture that black and white photo of the Hollywood sign above my bedroom door before I uh, actually moved to Hollywood. Always wanting, I want to go there. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to be in Hollywood. I want to act. And I was lucky enough to 
after a couple of years to connect with people in the Hollywood community that were so real, so true to themselves, like you were saying, and being, you know, whatever, you know, it, 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 I, I, you know, the word in a way, I can never define normal, but I'm so glad if normal is this thing that you say is in this box, I don't want to be in that box. Right. And I am so blessed, so blessed. And that's what got me all, I guess, teary eyed is that I am so thankful that the people I met in Hollywood took me through what you're saying about those open doors that if you, if you learn how to open those doors, uh, you know, it's like what Corey Allen, my, my acting teacher and dear friend used to say, what are you going to do with your next breath? Mm, you no, know? yeah, I mean, yeah. do you, are you going to block it? You're going to go, you right. know? So yeah. thank you for that, that, uh, you know, I didn't expect, you know, I want to, I kept on saying, ask him about normal, normal. But it's like, and it was something, it was like, you, thank you for being my therapist for the moment. <laughs> because it was, it's so- That'll be 150, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it really is that, that, you know, much like disability, I think normal is much more, uh, um, um, it can be much more than we ever anticipated it to be or expected it to be. You know, people do expect it to be kind of this little narrow thing, um, um, but it doesn't have to be. And it puts us way. in that box. It puts us in these little tiny, like, okay, take a step here, take a step here, rather than just flow with life, connect with those amazing people that you you feel like are your brothers and sisters for one reason or the other in life. Right, right. And and that are doing their own things, right? And having and and opening through the doors that have opened for them. It's it's you know, when you find those those people who become your community, right? Your inner circle. Um, um, you know, those that you lean on, you may not think that that person's going to be that when you first meet them, but you look back 10 years later and you go, oh, you're one of my buds, right? You know, there's something, something clicked. Um, um, and it's what I would hope that it, that it means is that, that our definitions of normal are such that we get to be all that we are. Again, you know, that, that I wouldn't be all that I am if I hadn't, you know, embraced the part of me, like I'm a vegetarian, I'm a Buddhist, I'm, I'm disabled. You know, there are a lot of different aspects. You, you know, talk about the work I've done, whether it's radio producer or curating things for Turner Classic Movies. Um, I've been lucky enough, I've been blessed enough to be able to explore all those different avenues. Other people should have those same opportunities. No one should be held back. Whatever you want to do with your life, you should have the opportunity to do those things. That should be your normal, right? That's the ideal world. Mm -hmm.